morning. Welcome to Coffee with KPP Live, the show that's dedicated to providing you with advice for life so that you can live richly and work towards the life that you've earned. My name's Kyle Roy. I'm a financial advisor with Kentucky Planning Partner, and I'm so grateful today to be joined with Bill Furco, who is a man that just carries so much experience, knowledge. He was the CFO of several large Fortune 500 companies has been in the business for of financial services, manufacturing, distribution, production, now owns a horse farm with his wife in Oldham County on several boards. Uh, and um, I, I just can't wait to share Bill's knowledge with you all, the viewer, because uh, it's incredible what you've done, Bill, and um, I just can't wait to dive in. So on behalf of everybody, thank you for, thank you for joining us. You're welcome, glad to be here. Well, and uh, thank you. And so in our conversation, so Bill and I met last week and we had coffee for a couple hours and I just was sitting in awe of how much you've known, your experience, the way you tell your stories. Um, and I, I can't wait to just to have you share who you are and what you've done. So if you don't mind, give the audience a quick over overview of your career, your experience going back from Tenneco to now sitting on a couple boards, please. Okay, I will do that. Um, before I start that, I'm going to go back even further. Okay. Um, so my first job was actually working for my father in a grocery store. Um, we bought the grocery store um, in anticipation of leasing it to somebody who would operate it uh, because he had been in the grocery business earlier. So we leased it out to this guy and, and uh, he basically went bankrupt. So we picked up this building and had to restore the business and get it going again. And how old were you? So I was in seventh grade. Then. Okay. So from seventh grade through eleventh grade, um, I worked for my father at this uh, grocery store. It was a convenience type grocery store. And this was in Wisconsin. In right? Wisconsin, okay. southeastern Wisconsin, in uh, Racine, Wisconsin, just south of Milwaukee. And uh, there, I learned uh, the lesson of hard work. I mean, every Saturday I would sort soda bottles between the Pepsi and the Coke and the 7-Up down in the basement where all these compressors were going for, for the coolers and the and the air conditioners. Um, well, and for those of you in Kentucky that don't understand why you'd sort soda bottles, so I grew up in Massachusetts. They were all returnable. That's yeah. right. You and get they had a deposit. That, in Michigan, it's $0.10, 10, yeah, cents, 10, 10 cents, 10 cents a can. So, so. It's just all part of the ESG thing nowadays, right? That's exactly right. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I did that. I stocked the shelves, took inventory. Um, Cut meat, waited on customers, delivered groceries. So I was the you know the the uh, delivery service you know that has been popular the last few years, um, and tarred the roof. I mean I did everything. <laughs> so um, we had riots back then, and just like we had here in Louisville or last year, and had our windows bashed in and cleaned up the windows, and you know got all that recovered. So um, that was something I experienced whatever 40 years ago, and experienced it again this past summer so mm -hmm. that's that was kind of the foundation for after that um, and that was so that was your education that was my education the school of hard business yes. yeah I love it we sold it when I just finished my junior year in high school and it was my first deal and I've done since then I've probably done whatever 80 plus M&A deals in my career but um, I was so relieved to have sold that grocery store to somebody so it's like it's like have a regular life. So I was I was able to kind of enjoy life a little bit. But it's like, what do I do? So uh, one of my father's friends was a Fuller Brush, which is like an Amway, Mary Kay, Avon type thing, uh, where you go door to door. And I would go door to door. Uh, and the first week you would hand out uh, catalogs, walk around door to door, stuff catalogs in the door. Next week, go knock on the door, ask people if they want to buy their cosmetics and cleaning products and brushes and that type of thing. And uh, Kirby vacuums. Uh, it was like Kirby All vacuums, right. <laughs> but, you know, similar things. And I did very well doing that. But then in southeastern Wisconsin, when you know it gets to be like twenty below zero and the snow is up to your knees, it was not a very good thing to do in the winter time. <laughs> so I got a job for a while washing dishes in a Chinese restaurant. And ultimately, then after that, um, in the spring of my senior year, I got a job rolling coin for a, a bank. Um, in it's called Bank of Elmwood. Um, and uh, and so for you know the end of my senior year, I was a coin wrapper, coin roller uh, in Man. this bank. And this was before you dumped 
your bucket of coins into the machine at the grocery store and it yeah. came out. So well, actually, I, we, we had Servomation, which is like the vending machine company, like Canteen. Okay. They would bring all these bags of coins over from the vending machines, and we, you know, I had a machine, and we'd wrap them. It was like a factory job. All right, so so it wasn't counting out each no, of them. So no, it's a no, little no. better was, than that. Yeah, the all machine right. counted out. Yeah, I was the first uh, robot there for counting coins. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember the, the trying to get the bottom fold correctly. My grandfather oh, yeah. was damn it, and I yeah. could never do it, so... So then after I graduated from high school, I could be a teller. So I was a teller, and then I uh, did that for my first year of college. So I lived at home, went to college at uh, University of Wisconsin at Parkside. And then eventually I got into loan collections, where I was a loan collector uh, for uh, consumer loans, car loans, that type of thing, which was nice. I was basically dialing, calling people up, asking them to pay, and if they couldn't pay, to bring their car in. And once a month or so, I'd have to go out and, and repossess a car. With, you know, I'd have a policeman with me, and we'd... And you're a sophomore in college, yeah, going to re- repo junior, cars. I was repoing cars, yeah. But you were the bank guy, not the muscle. Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually. My, for, so the, the common denominator between doing that and uh, doing the Fuller Brush deal where you knock on doors, and later, just last year, I was the uh, Kentucky uh, Republican nominee for Kentucky State Senate, where I do uh, canvassing, go door-to-door knocking on doors, although I was telephone calls during COVID. The common denominator is just not getting bit by dogs. I mean, that's, that's your challenge, is to, to go door to door and not get hit and got bit by any dogs. Never. I've bit, never been bit by a dog in my entire life. And like, you didn't have to keep kibble in your uh, No, I didn't have any like of that. that. No I just, you just kind of get a sixth sense for dogs, and if there's one that's going to get you, you just kind of avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, it's so funny because I've been fortunate to have met with many people successful executives like you and there usually is that common denominator in that you learn the value of work ethic yes Um, I've heard it again and again in that you can teach soft skills to people some people have conversational skills or they're great writers or whatever but you cannot teach work ethic you cannot teach that get up and go that self-motivating behavior to just get up in the morning want to go to work and find pride in that so um, you know, I love, I always talk to, to parents or if, if parents are asking me about college, you know, what to study at school, my common response is I'll say, well, in college, I find that you can learn in school many important things, but the most important thing you can learn is how to get, getting a job, whether it's working during school or during the summer, getting that internship is key because that's really how you find out what you the world is about. You learn a lot of the social skills. That's exactly. And even as a teller. You know, cashing checks back then. You didn't. You didn't. I mean, I. I was one of my goals was to be the fastest teller out there. Okay. So you're. You know, and, and we used on Fridays, like the third of the month, when the Social Security checks would come out, you'd have lines of people like ten deep in your. And it's like, okay, I want to work faster than you know the person next to me, and I'd cash checks and have. Very rarely would I make a mistake and cash a bad check type thing. So you learn that sixth sense and the skills of reading people and kind of knowing you know who's. You know who to trust and who not to trust and that type of thing. So let's move That's fast great. forward. So yeah. So working at the bank uh, and going to college, I thought, okay, I love this banking stuff. I'm going to be a banker. I thought, okay. Um, so I took finance courses when I was at uh, university, and I got my degree in business management with an emphasis in finance. A recruiter came on campus from J.I. Case International Harvester. They make construction farm equipment. Okay, so you still see Case equipment, C-A-S-E. C-A-S-E. Multinational. Yeah, international. Or, yeah, yeah, Case IH it's called now. We did a merger. Um, and uh, a guy came uh, from Human Resources, came on campus to interview for an auditor-type job. And I thought, okay, I, I don't want to be an auditor, but I will just interview for practice, just to do practice. Yeah. Well, they gave me a job offer that was make, you know, almost double what I was making at the bank. And it's like, man, I don't know. I just, I want to be a banker, but I can't pass up double the money, right? <laughs> There's a price so, for everything yeah. sometimes. So right? I took this job being an auditor, and it was 100% travel. So uh, we came home for holidays and, like, Christmas. Otherwise, we were on the road traveling around the United States. So I traveled two and a half years uh, auditing factories, you know, company-owned stores, uh, dealerships, warehouses, parts depots um, throughout North America. In fact, I spent more than six months in Canada, so they made me become a Canadian resident because I was in Canada in the in the summertime and in uh, California and Florida and Texas in the wintertime. Wow. Uh, spent 
three, four months in Australia, uh, doing audits there. And this is in your 20s? Uh, early 20s, now, yes. I can, now, I can imagine, though, they didn't do this for all young 20-year-olds. You must have done... You must have excelled in those roles to have been given that responsibility. It was, yeah, you were out there on your own in teams of two, mm -hmm. sometimes three. Um, you know, I became a lead after a while, and so then you know, I had groups of three or four that, you know, would work with me. And yeah, we would go to these stores or warehouses or factories and do the audits and check inventory and verify receivables and just, you know, make sure that financial controls were in place. Wow. It was a great experience, a great way to see the country. Uh, saved my entire paycheck because you could basically live on your expense report. We had a per diem. Sure. Uh, didn't have any rent, and uh, it was it was great. And what better way experience. to understand a diverse set of businesses I and mean, learn businesses? So you, you so you were able to see. I mean, there was an audit like every two weeks or so, and you could see which businesses run well mm -hmm. and which ones are struggling, and what the common denominator is between the businesses that are struggling and the businesses that are succeeding and it's leadership I mean it, it comes down to having a general manager that has a team around him or her who understand the business and understand kind of how to motivate people connect with people and to do the right thing mm -hmm. and um, so I learned a lot of my leadership skills there as well in, in terms of what it takes to run a good business is really what it comes down to but you know after doing that and traveling literally 300 and in fact you used to have to report on your tax return 320 days 330 days a year on the road um, I wanted to go back to grad school and get my MBA and you can't do that at least back then now you can probably with, with uh, <laughs> yeah. online get it uh, MBA uh, which I teach at UofL um, back then you had to be in one place to go to grad school so I, I came off the road went to grad school kept working for case as an accounting manager back in the southeastern Wisconsin um, and uh, did that, and uh, so that was all part of Tenneco. Uh, Tenneco was the 18th largest company in the Fortune 500 back then. It was so a, Case was part of Tenneco. Case was part of Tenneco. And so, so talk about that. So that was, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up. So Tenneco, you said 18th largest company in? The Fortune 500. All right. So Basically just, in North America. Well, all right, so, and, and Case was a subsidiary a of subsidiary. it. subsidiary. And you ended up doing an extraordinary job working with them Going back to get your MBA, but kept ties with Case while you were getting your I, MBA. I still worked at, I did my MBA part-time. Okay. And I All worked right. full-time. And Tenneco paid for my MBA program. Our Case and Tenneco paid for the MBA program. Um, so, um, so what was Tenneco? Let's talk about Tenneco. So yeah, now, Tenneco was, was a diversified conglomerate. Uh, for those of you who are, don't understand diversified conglomerates, it was like GE was. I mean, GE's breaking up now, too. Yeah. Berkshire Hathaway mm -hmm. is like a conglomerate, if you would. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, Wall Street started doing funds, mutual funds, if you would, uh, where they could put companies together, and basically you could have diversification within a mutual fund. Before that, before funds, um, there were conglomerates. There was ITT, there was uh, GE, there was Tenneco, there were a few others like that that would buy uh, groups of companies and you could buy a Tenneco or buy GE um, and have a diversified portfolio. So I worked for Case and then after um, I finished my MBA program, Tenneco invited me to come down to Houston where its headquarters were at the time um, and join the, the corporate finance staff. So I was a corporate finance manager, worked almost 95% of my time with Wall Street doing okay. doing Wall Street deals. And what Actually, my we, first deal... What years are we, where year are we now? That was 84 to 87. Okay, so My first deal was for us to buy International Harvester. So we put International Harvester in case the, the farm equipment business at Harvester. The IH kept their truck business and we took over the uh, farm equipment business. Okay, so let, let me just kind of summarize that last couple minutes because this is getting really, really good. So... Tenneco and Berkshire Hathaway type, type companies, you said something really important. This was yes. before mutual funds became really, really popular. So in order for average investors right now to invest in a diversified subset of companies, you generally use mutual funds, the right. ETFs if you want ETFs. to be in indices, things like that. And Tenneco was like a Berkshire Hathaway where an investor could buy Tenneco stock and they own companies like Case, like yes. International Harvester, like the paper companies that we're going to talk about in a moment. And Bill worked for Tenneco to 
pretty much picking which of those companies Tenneco was going to be investing in. So when, when he says, I worked on Wall Street and started working on these deals, now we're gonna, I wanted to ask you about these deals. We'll find these common denominators. What was fun about these deals? What were you looking at in terms of companies that you wanted to buy? And, and I want you to talk about too, for everybody that's done what you've done, you mentioned a little while ago, I worked about 80 so or so deals. There must have been hundreds or thousands that you said no to. Yes. Who knows? So yes. so now, so I think that there's a summary. So now let's go into, you're on Wall Street, you're looking at deals. What was the first Well, thing? I was in Houston, but okay. spent a lot of time working with Wall Street. So, yeah. um, and I was doing a lot of financings then too. I was doing interest rate swaps, doing bond deals, doing stock repurchases, doing a lot of things like that in the capital markets part of Wall Street. So I did that. Um, and, you know, while I was there, you know, we've, we did um, deals for the subsidiaries as well in Tenneco. And let me just give you a feel for what the companies yeah. were in Tenneco. So we had Case IH, which I told you about. Tenneco started in the, uh, during World War II building the natural gas pipeline that went from the Gulf Coast of Mexico, um, Gulf of Mexico, to New England. To, so they supplied all of the natural gas to like New York and Boston and Pennsylvania. Wow. So they built this big pipeline going up there. and. Um, Big pipeline is the understatement of the yeah, century. It was huge. From so they Texas were, to New York. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it, it continued to be able to supply that. We got into other pipelines and buying the gas and the oil that went, you know, was, went into the pipeline. Um, so we operated 450 gas stations. We had a refinery in Chalmette, Louisiana. We had um, oil exploration and production in the Gulf of Mexico, in California, in West Texas, in Colorado, the North Sea, um, in, uh, you know, in England, in, in Belgium, in the North Sea. And um, one of the deals was to buy uh, underground gas storage and, and oil and gas in Bakersfield, California. And we owned the land above it, so we basically built Bakersfield. The Bakersfield, California was like all desert. We built out the city. We developed the land, so we had uh, an agricultural business that uh, did almonds, and we put irrigation into all this land out in California. Um, we had real estate development company that uh, developed residential and commercial properties in Texas and in California and in Colorado. Um, a lot of it were the oil and gas was as well. Um, so we had uh, two life insurance companies. We had Southwestern Life Insurance Company, Philadelphia Life Insurance Company. Um, we continued to expand our natural gas pipeline distribution business, as well as the exploration, which you could explore for oil and gas, and production, which is the refinery that produced it and sold it in the gas stations. Wow. Um, and then we also had um, a paper company called Packaging, it's now two companies, uh, Pactiv and Packaging Corporation of America. Uh, it was called all called part of PCA back then, and at PCA, I was the the head finance person, group controller was called for the uh, paper mills and timberlands business as well as the molded fiber business that made egg cartons and paper plates and egg flats, McDonald's type carry out trays, um, and then I also we had uh, five paper mills, uh, made six to seven thousand tons per day. We had about a hundred box plants. Um, hundred bucks. So just just to put this this in perspective, I want to. It's it, I I loved talking to you about this last week because if you don't know, Bill, you talk about these companies like they're family members, and yeah. it's it's incredible how you're able to recall them. But I can also see how we go from Tenneco. Let's talk about Tenneco as a company that built infrastructure, pipeline infrastructure, and how it built this town and how it moves into all these other paper mill companies, boxing companies. And it really is a different time in American business when a company like Tenneco, in order to be truly successful, had to not only own the infrastructure that it was building, but it had to own the supporting infrastructure. So that's why it would make sense to build towns, own insurance companies to make sure the people were, were taken care of. You said an almond farm to make sure they're fed all the way down to the distribution of the oil, the gas stations, and well, I don't know how, how you got into boxes. Was it to make sure you, well, you know, wh how, why paper, why? So I guess why did that business model make sense as opposed to outsourcing it 
when you're coming up in the 70s and 80s as a massive conglomerate? How is it different than today? So it, it's really, in a, in a way, it's not. So Berkshire Hathaway is the perfect example of, of it. So we, we had a model in Tenneco of developing people and optimizing capital, okay? Um, so we, for like people in finance, which is a great area, I loved finance because you can move from like a staff job to a line job. So we have a, a career progression model to have a staff job, line job, staff job, line job. So my first job was in auditing was you know more of a staff job. Then I get back into the corporate finance where we're doing that's more of a line type job, and then back into uh, CFO of, of the paper business. By the way, I was also CFO of Monroe Shock Absorbers, so that's an automotive part of Tenneco, <laughs> and treasurer for all of Tenneco Automotive, which it made shock absorbers and walk. Monroe shock absorbers, Walker mufflers, I bought Clevite elastomers, we had Speedy Car X repair shops, so it was a, another part of Tenneco. And you were the CFO of that? Part. Yeah, I was the CFO of Monroe, treasurer of Tenneco Automotive, okay. which is really the only thing that's left that has the Tenneco name, so we, we broke it all up. But we optimized capital, so rigorous review, and, and those of you who have ever had a finance course, I encourage anybody who's never had a finance course to try to get familiar with finance to get to know what a net present value is to know what an internal rate of return is to know how to do a discounted cash flow to know you know what it takes to make a good investment mm -hmm. and so everything we invested in over i don't remember what the capital thresholds were every person in the company had different levels of authorization but we do rigorous reviews of proposals for investment whether it's buying a company or doing a greenfield, like open land to build a factory or to build a warehouse or whatever, we would do an analysis to look at what goes into that and what the expected cash flow streams are coming out of it to do a discount to cash flow internal rate of return. And, uh, or, uh, you know, to, to look at what's going to happen. And we do permutations of that, do scenarios of it to say, okay, what's the best case? What's the worst case? What's the middle case? And what happens if, the economy goes into a recession, and you know how we're going to do that. So, that that was you know one of the key things I learned is you know early on and from a finance perspective, mm -hmm. combined with having good people that understand how all that works, and it, it's the underpinnings for making good investments, and then having people that that make them work. Did you have any deals where you had all the numbers work? You had everything look great, the the valuations looked great. But getting back to the point you made before about the number one common denominator was great leadership. Did you, you may not recall them, uh, because I, I love how you recall all the deals you said yes to. Um, and you may have just put the ones that you turned away to the side, but were there any situations like that where you, where you had gone through the underwriting, everything looked great, but the leadership wasn't there? Yes, we did have some like that. Um, so as part of doing a deal, doing a merger and acquisition deal, so you go in, first of all, you, there's, you do a non-disclosure agreement, a confidentiality agreement. Mm -hmm. You get like a, a, a teaser from usually an investment banker or from somebody, or it could just be a relationship that you have that you, know, you say, okay, we're interested. This looks pretty interesting. Let's, let's, in, let's consider investing in this. So you do a non-disclosure agreement uh, or a confidentiality agreement and then you get typically more information. You might get a book, like an offering memorandum, or you may get you know, an invitation to come in and do due diligence. And so you get uh, under the covers and you get to know more of what's going on in the business. And then part of that we call it due diligence. So you go in and you do the due diligence, and I have a, a cookbook, if you, a recipe book, if you would, for doing due diligence. Where you, and you haven't published that? Uh, it's I mean, it could be standard. a bestseller. It's, it's pretty right. standard. I've shared it with a lot of people. but. You, you kind of go through the financial stuff. You go through what the intellectual property is or patents, what the in, you know, kind of innovation trends are for the company. You go through operations. You go through human resources. Um, you kind of get to know the management, the leadership team. And so as, as part of that, um, you know, you, and when you're in a, when I, these organizations I've worked in, um, and, and diversified operations where you can't manage it all yourself. It's yeah. not like they're cookie cutter. They're different businesses, okay? So you need a leadership team that's going to do a good job of managing it. You might be able to help them, give them a few more tools, teach them a few things that kind of let them see it a little bit different way, but still they, they're the same people. 
you need those people to be there, stay there, stay engaged, and continue to operate the business. And, and basically all of the deals I've done, um, our goal was not to replace the management team. Our, team. our goal was to help the management team to improve and to do better. Mm. And so if the management, and for some of these businesses, if it looked like they just wanted to get rich and go play golf all the time, we, we couldn't do it. I mean, we, we walked away from the deal because who's going to run this? Thing? I'm not going to run it. I mean, I can be there for a couple of weeks, but I need to go on to do another thing. So, mm-hmm. um, and if they said so they didn't have bench strength or have leadership that was going to stay there and be motivated to continue to grow and be more profitable and to do, be innovative and create, you know, new and better things, we took a pass. And so that was, that was part of it. So. Yeah, and I think that's a tremendous lesson in that it, that, that a company is only as good as the people that run it, quite frankly. It doesn't yeah. matter how large or small it is. A company's only as good as the people that run it. And there are human beings that are running these companies. You know, It's easy for some to say, well, those up in the ivory tower don't understand how things work. But the reality of the situation is it depends on who is up in the executive roles. Do they understand the business model? You said you had a purpose. What was the purpose of Tenneco to develop? I, you know, to develop people and to create wealth. I mean, to, uh, you know, that, that's one thing for all companies, I think, that, that a lot of people don't. So as you're an investor in a company and, um, you know, as you're a manager of a company or an investor, um, do you want to do worse this next year than you did the year before? <laughs> Nobody wants to see their earnings go down That's to go right. to the southeast or to go their sales to go down. Wall Street expects, investors expect everything to go to the northeast. Mm-hmm. So your sales are going to, they want the sales to go up, they want the earnings to go up, they want the cash flow to go up. So, but there are leaders who only want their wealth to go yeah, up that's as well, true. and yeah, you were able that, to recognize yeah, that. You can see that, yeah. yeah. Um, so if you don't mind, so. talk about de- decentralized command. You mentioned it briefly last week when we were having coffee, and it just seems that it, it's easy today for companies to micromanage because the technology for leadership to track where their sales force is minute by minute down to how much time their employees are spending doing personal things or not on their computers at work. It's easy to make sure you're tracking employee behavior. And your business model, you were forced to trust the leaders of each subsidiary that you were managing. And so if you don't mind talking about that, I mean, was that something that you had just learned? Did it just come naturally because you had to trust each each management team or... Did you have to fight the urge to micromanage? You know, my wife will tell me sometimes that she, I, I, my, or my children uh, will tell me that I micromanage. But, <laughs> <laughs> but really, in these companies, it's if we're in the in kind of the the, the companies I've worked with um, and the very diversified com- companies, um, it, it has you, you don't have a choice. You have to figure out how to if you're going to keep doing deals, keep growing uh, companies through acquisitions or have a diversified uh, type of company, you have to figure out a way to manage it without being there every day. And so having key, key KPIs, key performance indicators, um, was, was important. Uh, to base, and as a finance person, so we gathered those up and reported them. Now there's dashboards where you can see them every day. Every day. Um, but your, your leaders of your companies uh, need to be able to see those and to see how they're doing and again as I told you before one of the the key things from any company um, is innovation and creativity Mm -hmm. so fast forward I was the chief financial officer for Genlight which was headquartered here in Louisville Um, we had a fantastic CEO there a guy named Larry Powers who he's retired now Um, uh, but one of our one of our key things there that our sales this is light fixtures okay that are you know, you think, okay, what's a light fixture? It's just something you turn on. But a lot of you think about LED, how it's replaced, you know, the traditional light fixtures. But even when we ran this company, the challenge for that we put out to all of our managers was that, um, I don't remember exactly, it was like 35% of your sales had to be from products that were invented within the last three years. Say that again. That's really important. It was 35% of your sales had to be from products 
that were invented in the last three years. Wow! And Genlight was inventing these products. Yes. Okay. So that was that That's was the brilliant. innovation. That yeah. was the key to success for our company because if you don't have something that's proprietary or something that's unique that you own, we had over 500 patents in that company. Wow. We spent, sometimes we for spent- For light fixtures. For light fixtures. Incredible. We would spend upwards of 10 to $15 million in lawsuits defending our intellectual property, defending our patents for these light fixtures. Um, so <laughs> innovation and creativity and having intellectual property something that gave our salespeople something to sell. Yeah. So they're not just order takers. You know, they're not just selling commodity product. You don't need you don't need salespeople to sell commodities. I mean it's you know it's just more of the same type thing. I hear that. You yeah. you you need to create value, show your customer how you have something that nobody else has that's proprietary because your company has this patent, so we have the IP and um, well, gosh, and to be a salesperson every year and say, "All right, well, here's what's new." To, right. I mean, I, I, if I were a salesperson, I would tell every single one of my customers it is part of our culture yes. to deliver the latest, greatest product right. for you and your company, your company, and your experience. I mean, that's that's brilliant. And that was a driver for a lot exactly. of the companies that we bought. It. And so you know, I saw that as a young salesperson going door to door selling Fuller Brush. So we we had this product. It was a spray and wash product that you know you'd spray on. Like, so now uh, we're going back to high school. Back to high school. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going back to high school. <laughs> so this spray and wash, it was <laughs> nobody else had this spray and wash thing. So, but I had it, and it, you know I could you know, go knock on doors and show people this thing that worked for me. I had a lady chase me down the street wanting to buy a whole case of <laughs> spray and wash stuff, you know, because we were the only people that had it. So, I, and and so as, as part of my uh, what an experience my, to carry forward to your role as Jet Life. No kidding, uh, and really part of my MBA program. One of the uh, papers I authored and got published was top management's role in uh, technological innovation. Mm -hmm. So that carried forward to it was you know part of my MBA program, and I was you know finance background, but I appreciated the importance of innovation and creativity. So contrast that with the experience you had with the printing press company in the 90s. So before the show started, uh, Bill said, why don't you, if you recall, I told you that I was the CFO of a printing press manufacturer that uh, pretty much provided all the printing presses in North America, and you said about 40% in Europe? Or the rest of the world. The rest of the world? Yeah. And I said, no, I forgot about that. So so talk about that for a moment and what you learned about innovation there. Talk about that business, the cost of one of those printing presses to give people the idea of the size and scope because this isn't just your, you know, this isn't Benjamin Franklin sitting in a small room, you know, with printing tiles. It's a big organization. And talk about what you learned about innovation there. So now we're going back to the mid 90s. Okay. Before we go there, Lyle, okay, please. Tentacle. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Pardon. In addition to Tentacle having Case IH, um, the construction farm equipment, oil and gas, natural gas pipelines, gas stations, two life insurance companies, paper and packaging products. We had a million two hundred thousand acres of trees. Wow. Uh, those five paper mills and all the box plants, the molded fiber. We had aluminum and plastic packaging as well. Uh, then automotive, which was the Monroe shock absorbers and the Walker mufflers. We had Newport News Shipbuilding, which built all of the aircraft carriers and the large nuclear submarines for the Navy. We had um, Albright and Wilson Chemicals Company, which was the largest phosphorus-based chemicals company. We did phosphoric acid for like Coca-Cola and things like that. <laughs> um, what else do we have? Uh, it, so it was truly a diversified conglomerate. Wall Street decided mutual funds can do better. We broke it up. Berkshire Hathaway, I think, does a great job mm -hmm. because you can see exactly what's working and what's not. You can take Maybe you know if some companies in an up cycle, you can take excess cash, redeploy it into opportunities, value opportunities, and other businesses that you understand very well, and, and what the best internal rate of return or net present value is. When you're looking at, you've got more projects than you possibly can fund, so you find the best ones and you put deploy the capital there to have the best return. So it's a great model. Let's fast forward too. And it, so and after, it literally is. It's it's a. The, you were a portfolio manager before portfolio managers. Yes, were thing. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, and a definitely. portfolio manager is the the team, usually one or two individuals that are buying and selling the stocks in a mutual fund. So yes. that's that's what you're doing. And diversification is very important because you yeah. never know what's going to happen. That's right. But um, 
So fast Innovation forward. Then. So I, after 20 years with Teneco and the, all this big diversified conglomerate, I left there and did a CFO role for a chief financial officer role for um, a company that made newspaper printing presses. It was in the mid 90s, and um, the the company I worked for did all of the basically all of the, the large newspaper presses for North America. Newspapers are going from black and white to four color type presses like USA Today was one of the first ones that the Gannett company. And so we were doing quite well. So we, Rockwell was breaking up at the same time Teneco was breaking up. So Rockwell had the space shuttle business, the aviation, they sold that to Boeing. They had Alan Bradley, they had uh, uh, Collins Avionics. So Rockwell was breaking up at the same time Teneco was breaking up and Goss, the newspaper printing press business was one of their spin outs and so I took that with a leverage buyout um, organization and we took it public debt private equity. And and Bill's humility is coming through here. Just to give you an idea of the printing presses here, one printing press could cost up to a hundred million dollars yes. for a printing press. So these are the machines that take up half of a warehouse that the New York Times, for instance, would get the final print at one o'clock in the morning and print hundreds of thousands by three o'clock in the morning to have delivered before everybody gets up for breakfast. Yes. So, so this is a massive company, a massive operation that has tremendous technology. Yes. And around the time that I, I joined there, presses were going from analog controls to digital controls on the rollers that make the presses. We were going from um, did offset printing, uh, which is like you make characters that go on these rollers to like photographic type negatives, to digital type. We were one of the innovators for digital printing, and uh, looked at. I bought a company called Deline, um, that was in a German company, an innovator in digital technology, um, and so I. With that one, I spent a lot of time traveling, trying to you know, hundred million dollars is a lot of money. So you need to work with your customers mm -hmm. to find money for them to get these presses out there. So and I'm sure I, not just selling them, but servicing them as well. If something them. goes wrong, yeah. I mean, building the so it's not just a one and done deal. So I spent a lot of time in Brazil and Argentina and Europe and Asia, China, Japan, trying to get this all put together. So after a couple of years, though, the internet was coming along. And it was getting increasingly challenged because newspapers were like, okay, where's this internet going? They basically printed money in their classified ads. Now there's no classified ads, right? It's all, you know, there's, it's all, you know, Facebook Marketplace or uh, eBay or whatever. Well, and that question of, so that was something on your minds, where's this internet thing going? Exactly. You know, and, and talk, talk to about innovation too, you couldn't have possibly seen where it was going. We saw the digital part of printing, and now there's all digital printers, there's no offset printers. Yeah. And we saw the digital controls on the system and digital, so in process industry, so Teneco had the paper mills were process industry, the um, oil refineries were process industries, discrete manufacturing is where you're putting parts together. So I've worked in both discrete manufacturing and process industries. The controls on printing presses were more like process industry. It was. You know, it's had to go real fast. You know, the best environments where nobody's touching it, where everything the machine just runs by itself, and uh, so you need computer controls and things like that. So that that's where we kind of saw that going. Uh, but in reality, the internet was so much bigger than all of that that it just kind of took over the whole communications and you know media. And now we're going to five G. You know, it's just amazing how things have evolved. You know, I, I read um, I, I don't know I think it was a podcast that I was listening to where an executive said. You know, you look at some of these companies like Kodak that no longer exists, Blockbuster no longer exists, and it comes down to the goal, the purpose of the company, right? So Apple is just absolutely crushing it, um, but it comes down to what the purpose is. So I think about the paper, pre the printing press company. I wonder if, because you now you say that company is just a shadow of what yes, it was. Yes, absolutely. You know, the question is, well, was it a printing press company or was it a company that had whose goal was to deliver information as efficiently as possible. Because if it's a printing press company, then it will go by the way of the printing yeah, press. Absolutely. Whereas if it's an informational delivery company, it would maybe, could it have sought different yeah, ways to, to yeah. bob and weave? Is, is that a way to look at innovation? Yes. What is the purpose of the company? Yes. Yeah, that's a good, good thought, yeah. No. Um, so you didn't see yeah. the internet coming? Oh, we saw it coming, <laughs> yeah, no. we saw it coming, but we didn't see it. 
you know, having the presence that it has. Today. So t now fast forward back to Gen Light, Gen where Light. part of your experience, so you had to have been able to draw on that. Now, granted, it, it was, you'd mentioned it was luck that you got out of the printing press company it before was. the internet took it over, but I, I love seeing these transparencies of your career. Uh, you started with the grocery store, the sale, your first deal, how grateful you were to get out of that. And I, I kind of put a mental note how you said, oh, thank goodness that sale is done. Now I can go to a normal life. So senior in high school, he was selling cosmetic products. That's normal senior guy job, you know, like yeah. after. But, but then you see that, how it carries forward to all these roles. So now let's talk about Genlight, how you built that company from where you started to what you sold. And that's, that's you so should So with proud. Genlight, I was recruited. Uh, Genlight was headquartered in New Jersey. Um, it had a market cap of roughly $350 million. It was publicly traded. Um, and we did a deal to merge um, Genlight's lighting business with the lighting division of Thomas Industries, which was headquartered in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we put them together based on the, uh, the earnings contribution of each business. So Genlight got 68% of the interest in the business. Thomas Industries, which is another publicly traded company, got 32% interest. We formed an operating company called Genlight Thomas. Um, I was the CFO of both Genlight, which owns 68% of this company, and the CFO of the operating company called Genlight Thomas, where we had 100% of both the 68% and the 32%. Okay. So we operated the lighting business. We put it together. Um, and at the time we did all that, after it was all done, I came to Louisville um, from the Chicago area. Uh, the CEO of Genlight was in New Jersey. He came to Louisville, and we picked up, we put this business headquarters together with the lighting division headquarters people of Thomas Lighting. So we had the Thomas Lighting division people. Um, and Larry and myself, we came down here and uh, put it all together. And uh, we picked up a great team, the Thomas Lighting people. Um, they, were, they were division people, but Thomas wasn't there. They were, you know, they were great, talented people. I uh, had a wonderful team um, that uh, joined me, or I joined them. Um, and you know, Jerry, uh, Larry brought in a lot of these values that I, I told you about. Larry was just the most trusting people person. He was a, the consummate salesperson. He brought in the values of innovation mm -hmm. and the importance of, you know, into the company, which I appreciated. That was one of the reasons I joined is I just, you know, when I first met him up in New Jersey and, and I was going through his office and looking at all these neat new products, I thought, wow, this is really cool. So I, that's why I joined and, and, and Larry was just a wonderful person. Um, and so we teamed up. Um, and during, I was, you know, I've joined in 1998, November of 98. Um, and between then, and we sold it to, to Phillips in, in January of 2008. Um, we did roughly two or three M&A deals every year and mm. bought all these different companies that were in the lighting business. Um, we bought like a theatrical lighting company. So we, we had these lights that are used at theaters. They had 32 little servo motors where the light fixtures would move around. Now you see a rock concert or a Broadway play, and you see the light fixtures and the colors changing. Well, years ago, they'd put um, like gels in, in each each light fixture. There'd be hundreds of light fixtures for with different colors, and there'd be control rooms and things. And so we bought a couple of companies that were involved in that, and they had these moving light fixtures where the colors would change. It would go from a wash to a spot. It would be digitally programmed ahead of the show. I mean, it was just computers and light fixtures are, yeah, you know, epitome of, of technology coming together. Uh, took some of that technology and moved it into other parts of our business. Um, but we did, you know, a controls business for dimming controls and light switches that, um, you know, had dimmers on them and, you know, whole, whole house automation and that type of thing. Um, kind of managed the process from incandescent lighting to fluorescent and the uh, uh, coming of, of LED. Uh, we partnered with Philips, which ultimately uh, we sold our business to. Uh, Philips was a great innovator with new Philips's, that they, they have an engineering group in uh, Europe that's uh, none can compare to. I mean, their, their passion and vision for engineering and new products was totally aligned with ours. And so we, they did the light bulbs and you know they helped us kind of 
we worked around their their technology and put our technology together. So in, in some ways we were partners even before we, we merged our businesses together. Um, so when we sold it to Philips, so we sold uh, Genlite, um, it was, that was a sad sale. My grocery store sale was a happy sale. I was like, oh man, this is, <laughs> I was so just relieved. When I sold Genlite to Philips, although I, we all did very well financially. Well, the market cap was $350 million. You started, when I started and you sold it to Philips for, for $2.8 billion. $2.8 billion with a B, yet it was a sad sale. Because, you know, I, you know, I lost control. Yeah. Uh, Phillips wanted me to stay for a year, so I stayed for a year until 2009. And, uh, but I was leaving behind all of these companies I put together and the people and the relationships and just doing what we did. And Larry wanted to retire. I mean, he was 66 years old. And, well, and I think, but you said something that's subtly, I, I think it's so important, but you embody it in that it was a sad deal. Was it the largest deal of your career? Selling uh, la largest sale deal probably I don't know I've done well, we bought I, I I've close done to it sim yeah similar so, deals. But, and you would assume that it could have been the, one of the pinnacles of your career but this I think goes back to leadership and why great leaders are what they are because it's not about the money no. necessary the money and the profitability and the finances and understanding whether or not the foundation is good is integral it's yeah. part of smart business obviously we want right. to make money. But, but you just embody that, again, I love how you talk about your deals and the companies and what you've learned and what you found fascinating about them. And, and you really just took pride in the teams, the products, and the people with an eye of how you were delivering it to the end consumer, the services that you were actually providing. And you have literally changed the world. You've worked with people that have changed the world. You might balk at that, but we look at LED lights just around us, and we look at light fixtures now, and we go to a concert, and we're in awe of the light shows. And, and you know, it's, these are little things that, that, quite frankly, impact the world. And yes, you've profited from it. Yes, a lot of people, you've influenced the lives of thousands of people, the employees, and you've been able to build that wealth. But the idea wasn't necessarily just about the money. It was about what product are we delivering to the end user. And I think that's inspirational, quite frankly. And it's, in, in a way, it's the thrill of the chase. I mean, it, it's f like having children, if you would. You, you put these teams together. You have the people who work in the business become your friends. You want them to do well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you want the, their families to prosper and, and to do well. And uh, you want your, your customers to appreciate what you're doing too. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it is that that's what kind of keeps you going every day and keeps it fulfilling. And so, yeah. So I created this wonderful business and sold it to Philips, and and they, uh, you know, they, they took it over. But um, it was it was hard to kind of leave the team. It was the people. Mm -hmm. It was so much. Yeah, I got wealthy. I mean, I made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, I did okay. But um, it was, um, and all of my staff did too, which that was fulfilling. But that's a byproduct um, of doing a good yeah, job, right? That's, it's, it's like that it making money shouldn't be the goal. Making money and running a profitable business should be the byproduct of running a good, strong business that delivers good products. And putting it with Philips, which was a great innovator, mm -hmm. um, was, you know, that was a good home for it, yeah. if you would. So um, it was fun. That was, and as I said, paper in grad school, technological innovation, mm -hmm. um, learning the importance of technology, you know, throughout my career was, you know, carried throughout. And again, giving salespeople something to sell yeah. uh, was, was important as well. So, well, we're coming up on the hour and I'd love to close out with, with a couple of questions about, so now you teach, you're teaching the MBA class at UofL and the equine finance class at, uh, at UofL. Now, there are a lot of jokes behind equine finance, like, you know, what's the best way to make a million dollars in horses? It's to, in, what, it's to invest Start two with million. two million. Start right? with two million, <laughs> yeah, right. and, you know, that's how you make a million. <laughs> but, uh, but let's talk about the, the young people that you're coaching and teaching now, because uh, several times in our conversations, I told Bill that I was so grateful that he was able to share his knowledge with you because the wealth of knowledge that he has really is just, it, it really is, I'm humbled by, by you joining me here. 
So talk about what you'd like to share with young people that are coming up through the MBA program. You might tell them, or if children are looking to, what, are, what do they want to decide for their major? What advice would you give them now? Is there a major that you like more than others, or just general advice that you'd give young people? So I, I, I think that um, having majors, uh, ha having um, some creativity, I think is important. Um, you can learn that in a liberal arts program, you can learn that in a business program. Um, finance is critical, whether you're a liberal arts major, you know, a history major, or uh, you know, you know, a lawyer, like my daughter's a lawyer. Um, I encourage everybody to understand finance. Take one course in corporation finance. Mm -hmm. Not personal finance is important too. Personal finance, you'll learn the things the diversification. You'll learn, you know, what uh, you know, EPF, earnings per share is. You'll Different learn stock and a bond, and a stock yeah. and a bond, yeah. and you know, some portfolio diversification things like that. Corporation finance, where you learn that you know what goes in. What is the meaning of internal rate of return? Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of net present value? How, how does compounding work? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the little exponent. I mean, you don't. You kind of understand, you don't have to do you know, a bunch of exponents your whole life, but understand how it works and understand how the compounding of money, the compounding of investments creates wealth and, and creates a return on investment, whether it's an ESG investment or an oil refinery investment. You, know, it needs, you need to understand what's going into these and how do I deploy and how do I invest and how do I manage it is my personal portfolio or the decisions in the company I work for. Why are the decisions in a company to invest in, um, you know, whether it's a, you know, machines over plant people. or machines over people? Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of my goals throughout my career is to figure out how do I eliminate my job and the job of everybody who works with me and for me. Wow. So that we basically, how do I automate everybody's job and, and to get rid of the repetitive, mundane type of work so that they're freed up to be thinkers, to be creative, to be innovators. Not so that I'm going to fire them or lay them off, but so that they can do something you know, that adds more value than, mm. that, than the just repetitive type of boring type work. Yeah. And so whether it's a computer system that and most computer systems have eliminated a lot of the main mundane clerical, secretarial, that type of work. Um, a lot of the work that's in factories where people were tracking things you know, manually is, is monitored by sensors and computer systems that are in the factory and people are now you know, freed up from doing a lot of that to um, things that are less repetitive. There's mm -hmm. still some repetitive work and the Federal Reserve of, uh, Bank has a good model for the four different types of careers. There's cognitive or intellectual work that is repetitive and non-repetitive. And then there's non-cognitive work that doesn't require a college degree or whatever that's both repetitive and non-repetitive. So the repetitive work, whether it's cognitive or non-cognitive, can be automated by mm -hmm. robots, by machines, by computer systems, that type of thing. And we need to keep investing wherever there's a good return uh, to be able to, and with you know, labor cost, you can't even find labor now. So part of the cost of labor is the opportunity cost of not having the labor, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, and those repetitive jobs now that can't be filled, it's almost a guarantee eventually yeah. that necessity is the mother of all invention. Yes. So you know that those repetitive jobs will be filled by a machine. Yes. So either go to work yes. and, and fill them before the machine does or figure out how to master those non-repetitive jobs. Yes. Yeah. So then there's the cognitive non-repetitive. So that's whether it's an engineer that like my son is just trying to finish his master's degree in electrical engineering and computer science. So he's doing artificial intelligence. He's doing... He's creating know, the technology creating, to yes. fill the repetitive jobs. Yes. <laughs> um, so that's the cognitive <coughs> non-repetitive. And then there's the non-repetitive non-cognitive. So it's going to be difficult like landscapers. You know, people who are doing it's manual work. You don't necessarily need a college degree to do it, but it's hard to think of, okay, how do I get a robot or a computer or you know some machine? Mm -hmm. We can maybe make it easier, but we're not going to totally eliminate it. So you know, those are the four models, and you think, okay, where do I fit into those type of, of models? 
And then, you know, if, if your job can be automated or can be made a bit more efficient, you know, you can work on the process of helping to make that happen mm -hmm. and kind of gain some skills of, okay, I've, you know, you know created some capital or some, some way of doing that to uh, make the world better. And then I can go and do something else that makes it, make, that makes the world even better, mm -hmm. even better. So that's, that's part of capitalism. It's, it's investing so that, I mean, the utopia mm -hmm. is where nobody works, right? <laughs> so everybody is just, it's that's like, debatable. <laughs> you're, you're golfing and there's computers that mow the grass oh. and you know, what are computers that are robots that, you know, carry your golf clubs or whatever, you know, but it will never reach that utopia, yeah. right? I mean, we're never going to get there. Well, but, some of I us mean, love to go on the farm on the weekend and yeah. love mowing the grass, yeah. you know, so, but, but I think you're right. It's, it's to that point where it seems like automation, automation is an inevitability. I think we can all agree. And it may seem terrifying because our jobs are going to be replaced with robots, but but in reality, it sounds like what you're saying is that, that that repetitive job might not be aligned with you as the individual's best self or your human nature. It, right. it, it, it could imprison or inhibit your creativity and your ability to find joy and create and do those things that make you you. We say live, live your best life, right? And, and live richly. It, yes. uh, it, it may keep you from doing that. And, uh, and I think you're right. That, that's brilliant advice. Yeah. So... You know, ha you know, what, any kind of undergrad, creativity, innovation, thinking outside the box, you know, working with other people that have different majors, different backgrounds, and uh, appreciating their contribution. And then, but understanding finance, so you can and take that idea, take that innovation, take that product, put some capital into it, mm. and make it happen. I mean, that that's the, and then watch it. Now, some aren't going to work. You'll have some failures, but, sure. you know, you're going to have some tremendous successes too so. well and without failure you can't have success yeah and, that's true you and you know there's something I often say is follow the money right even if you're even if you're investing in a nonprofit understanding finance will we call them nonprofit organizations but they need to pay bills they need to keep their lights on and and it's important to understand how you're investing in them because when you follow the money money doesn't have emotion well, right true. so understanding the finances can really help you understand. And so one of the workers. nonprofits I work with on that note is Dismas Charities. So Dismas Charities is a prison reentry business. I'm the chairman of the board. For, I'm a volunteer chairman of the board for Dismas Charities. Um, we have 35 facilities that serve in 14 states. Uh, we serve about 8,000 prisoners coming out of long-term incarceration, where they're in a federal or a state prison, coming back into society. And our goal, and some of them been in locked up for 20 years wow and so they're coming out they don't have a driver's license they don't have a social security card they don't have birth certificate they, they don't have any credentials they don't know how to fill out a job application they may not know how to use a phone right yeah I mean gosh 20 years so our goal is in the first three weeks of when they start they come to us is to get them identification papers to get you know put them through programs where they learn how to interview for a job to apply for a job and to get them a job that's great. So in three weeks, we'd get them a job, and then they get increasing freedom so they can come and go, and we drug and alcohol test them as they, they come and go out of our facilities. Um, you know, we have, we have about uh, 2,700, I think it is, beds where people are in our facilities. Wow. We have another 1,000 who are on ankle bracelets and home incarceration. that We, we put those roughly 10 social programs, classes, if you would, that we put them through to learn life skills, whether it's anger management or filling out a job application, whatever. Um, and our goal is to get them a job and get them back in society to be productive so that they are productive members of society mm. and um, to create value for our society. To, I mean, one of our... And their life, and each individual, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you're obviously providing a service for each individual. Yes. But it's also for greater greater the yes. greater good. Yes, that's awesome. So um, I I mean so for me now at my point in my life is to do things like this to help people to learn for you know the people the clients of Dismas to get back into society for my students to learn how they you know what it takes to make a difference to enjoy their career um, with the help of finance and innovation coming together. Mm. Um, and with people skills, you know, to that's why I appreciate presentation. So the students learn how to present their ideas, how to 
work in teams because you can't do it all alone to put teams together to create the ideas to figure out how we're going to take them to market um, and develop those skills as well so beautiful um, that's what it takes well Bill thank you for coming on I, I can't thank you enough I, I just I, I the time has flown for me and I, I feel like I've only tapped a small one percentage point of one percentage point of your <laughs> of your intellectual capacity so maybe we can have you back at some point sure. in the future um, and uh, just thank you on behalf of everybody okay. at KPP and uh, for those of you that are out there I mean so is there if somebody has a question could they maybe send you an email to the U of L email address I mean could people get so the yeah I have two emails so WG Furco at bellsouth.net is like my per but that's where most of my email goes to um, or my school email is William dot Furco William dot F E R K O at Louisville dot edu so that works too either one works. Ben, well thank you for sharing your knowledge sharing your sure. yourself with the, with the group and uh, so on behalf of everybody here at Kentucky Planning Partners thank you for watching uh, I really think you and I have been attracted together because our goal at KPP is the same we say our goal is to provide advice for life so that you can live richly and work towards the life that you've earned and that's not just about the amount of money you have it's really right. have allowing and understanding your finances your personal finances so that you can spend the time doing those things that make you you that make you happy that you can share your talents and your skills with others and until you understand your finances your financial health your financial well-being will allow you to free yourself and and provide provide be a blessing for everybody else so you've done that you've Good. done that and thank you and um, if you have any questions for us at Kentucky Planning Partners feel free to give us a call we're at 502-394-0400 we're located in the heart of Louisville's east side in the flash cube building on the corner of Hurstbourne Lane and Shelbyville Road so Bill thank you again uh, and on behalf of everybody here at Kentucky Planning Partners we'll look forward to seeing you soon okay thank you mm -hmm.